This week on This is America and the World, part one of a two-program roundtable discussion on stress in America and how to deal with it. Our guests are all professionals in the field of psychology, Dr. David Kufer, Dr. Vale Wright, Dr. Jonathan Dalton, and Dr. Alfie Breland Noble. I am so excited to have you all here and have this conversation about stress in America. Boy, are we living, are we living under some stress, doctor? I'd say we are, yes. <laughs> I'd say we are. All agree? Yes. Yes. Stress yes. is stress. Yes. Uh, report. Uh, American Psychological Association, Stress in America. You're part of the team. I am part of the team. Tell me a little bit about the report and just a couple of, highlight, couple of highlights. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Americans consistently report that work and money are their top two stressors. However, mm. in our most recent survey, stress related to the future of the nation actually was the top. Whoa! Really suggesting that there seems to be something going on beyond just individual level stressors, uh -huh. but that people are now reporting these sort of national level stressors in a way that they haven't in the past. Whoa. you got a lot of people coming in, private practice, clinical practice. Uh, wh what are you perceiving in the confidential relationship between, say, a client and the therapist? Well, there is, like the uh, APA report suggests, a kind of breakdown happening in America in a couple of ways. Oh. People hate each other for political reasons where in the past they just moderately disliked each other. <laughs> and that, <laughs> what is it's it? hard to have peace inside you mm -hmm. when there's a lot of war between you and your neighbors, literally. And I have people coming in saying that things like, you know, I'm a Republican and now my neighbors don't talk to me anymore. Whoa, whoa. And that's a problem. Uh, let's get some definitions on the table, Dr. Dalton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, stress, mm -hmm. uh, anxiety, worry, uh, help, me, help, help us yeah, all understand it so we have a baseline. Yeah, they're the same cluster. Stress is, is really emotional strain due to highly demanding circumstances. Um, so it's a reaction, basically. Okay. Um, anxiety, I define as more of a future-oriented, diffuse apprehension, and it can be about a lot of different things. Worry is a manifestation of um, anxiety and stress. And um, a lot of people engage in worry, but it's often divorced from problem solving, and that's under which the circumstances where it becomes um, less useful and, and less helpful for them. One of, one, of the, one of the most important things I read in all of the research to uh, prepare for our conversation uh, had to do with worry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the idea was if, if you start to worry about something and you keep worrying about it, you just kind of dig yourself oh. into a deep hole and uh, but the trick is to cut it off uh -huh. to stop stop it uh -huh. because once that train starts moving it's hard to stop after mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. let me ask you a question doctor they call you dr alfie right That's correct. yeah um people of color uh -huh. men women uh, -huh. uh young people which uh -huh. i know is your uh, specialty uh are there different reactions to this stress in America? Who's, 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 who's taken the hit on that? So I think it's a combination of things. I think part of it is that the triggers, there are universal triggers. Everybody worries, as you said, about money. They're about hating their neighbors or wow. about the neighbors hating them. I think for what we call marginalized communities, there's a different set of stressors. There's an additional set of stressors. So uh -huh. if you think about LGBTQ populations, yep. if you think about people of color in general, mm -hmm. if you think about young people, if you think about women, there are ways in which they're taxed by things like discrimination, racism, racial stressors, racial trauma, um, that sort of exacerbates the other types of stress. And then mm -hmm. going back to this idea of worry, I think for many people, particularly in communities of color, where we look at anxiety differently than mm -hmm. we do in, in maybe some majority culture folks, there's this idea that worry is sort of normal. Mm. Everybody worries, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. But we don't talk about it. And uh -huh. so no one's ever given me a language for what this worry means. And because I don't have a language, I think it's normal. I live with it. And when someone suggests to me that it be different, I don't really have a response for that. Uh, so we got we got stress, we got anxiety, we got worry on the table, and talk amongst yourselves because uh, Dr. Dalton kind of uh, kind of laid out uh, some parameters, uh -huh. uh, but any. Any additional thoughts uh, uh, that come to your mind in a definition of stress? Because we're talking about stress in America. Dr. Wright, you want to add to sure. what the Sure. I, I think there's a couple different things. One is um, stress can happen for adverse circumstances, but yeah. sometimes those are positive events and sometimes those are negative events. So we can feel stress about things like getting married. Uh 
sure, which is generally sure, sure. considered a positive event. Okay. Um, and we can also feel stress about things like losing a job, which oh. would generally be considered a negative event. Okay. So stress is just our body's response to things that are taxing us, okay. and then we have an emotional and or physical sort of symptoms that result from it. There's nothing wrong necessarily with stress. Okay. It's when stress goes untreated and becomes chronic that and unmanaged, that's when we really have a problem. Okay, so you said finance is one mm -hmm. and, and work. Those are, those are two stressful situations. Mm -hmm. And then we've added into the dimension oh, okay. something about the nation feeling. And, and did th th that trigger with the, the, the election in 2016? Is that, is that, can you kind of chart that in a way? Yeah, absolutely we can. So we started asking about these sort of nation level stressors right before the election. Uh, in part because psychologists were reporting to us that patients were coming into their offices reporting all this stress, social divisiveness in their family, um, a lot of uncertainty about what the future holds, and so that's when we started to ask the question. Uh, individual stress was high, it was high related to the election, and then it spiked right after the election mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so we do think that there seems to be um, this increase in stress related to things like the future of the nation, people feeling like this is the lowest point in the history of our country, and a lot of uncertainty about what is to come. Uh, we're gonna take a little break uh, just to, uh, and, and during that break we'll uh, identify everybody sitting around the table. And then when we get back on the other side, continuing the conversation about stress in America, I want you to get me out of the way and talk amongst yourselves so, so it's not just question and answer, because I want sure. you to interact and uh, we are thrilled, uh, I am thrilled personally, because I am a great believer in uh, therapy, I'm a great believer in the process, psychology, psychiatry, uh, it's all incredibly important. Uh, I, I probably sit in this chair because uh, it's not only what people know, but what makes people tick, and that is of great interest to me. Uh, for psychologists, uh, American Psychological Association has put this uh, round table together with Thrilled. Uh, I'll stop talking. This is America and the world. We'll come back on the other side. Sit tight because you might be feeling a little stress. This is America and the World is brought to you by Whittle School and Studios. The U.S. China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President, the League of Arab States, the Republic of Haiti, the Rotondaro Family Trust, Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow, the Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward thinking public policy and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Uh, uh, you folks at home should have been part of this conversation <laughs> during this little break that we've just had. We got so many things on the table. Uh, David, go ahead. Well, one of the things that we were just talking about is uncertainty. Yeah. And uncertainty is certainly a major cause of stress. Uh, a lot of what I do in my work with people uh, is help them accept and tolerate uncertainty because you can't get rid of it, especially in you know, the fast-paced, rapidly changing lifestyle that most Americans live right now. They don't know as much as they would like to know about their future as far as their economy, their health, their, how their kids are going to turn out. And a lot of what I do to help people manage their anxiety uh -huh. and stress is to help them accept that if the bad news is they don't know the future, the good news is maybe they don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, jump in, jump yeah, in. No, come on now, come on. Because I, I do a lot of the same work, and I always say that trying to get certainty is like trying to grab a handful of smoke. You can see it, but you can never grasp it. And I, I conceptualize anxiety as really an allergic reaction to uncertainty where people are, are believing that they should be certain and that um, somehow it's intolerable to not know for sure what's going to happen next. And um, and so what we want to do is to teach people what you were saying, which is that that is ubiquitous in terms of our life experience, that we can never be certain, and yet we can grow tolerant of that experience, and that we can really not confuse thoughts with evidence. A lot of people, w one of the, the common threads across all the anxiety disorders that we treat is a complicated term, but an easy concept, which is the term is overvalued ideation. 
And what it simply means is people think their thoughts are more important than they are. So <laughs> once we can help people to say, thoughts happen, right now I'm having a scary thought about what tomorrow may bring, they're orienting themselves into the present moment because anxiety and stress often lives in the future. And if you can realize that you're having a scary thought, it's like watching the behind the scenes video of a scary movie. Mm -hmm. You stop believing it because it's there. Uh -huh. But uh, I, I was incorrect according to all, uh, <laughs> the way in of this worry and then stopping it. That's, that's not the way uh, it's treated nowadays or do I gather there's well, something new? So I think part of it is, I think it depends on what your, the framework is that you use to treat people. So as these gentlemen have shared, there's a, there's a part of the field, much of the field that doesn't do thought stopping anymore. Mm -hmm. I think for others of us, what we try to do is translate the concepts in a way um, that resonates with different communities. So most of the people I work with happen to be in marginalized communities and I can't really speak to them about thought stopping because it, conceptually it's not something that resonates with them. I think what ah. I can talk about yeah. is identifying signs and symptoms and then finding ways to tolerate, as they've said, those signs and symptoms once you have identified them. So things like mindfulness, right? Teaching people, as I just heard my colleagues say, being present yeah. is key. Not uh -huh. thinking about what's coming, not thinking about what just happened. If you can be right in the moment, you can do, I think, some of that thought stopping, but it's sort of a natural process. You're not actively trying to stop the thoughts. The thoughts are stopping because you're focusing on right here and right now. So we've got three, 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 three work, uh, finances, and uh, the state of the nation, right? Mm -hmm. Those three are on the table. Uh, and uncertainty. We're talking about uncertainty and a level of acceptance as well at the same time. What? Uh, so if those are the causes, of people's stress right now. We've simplified it, but those mm -hmm. are the causes. What, how does it manifest itself? What are the symptoms that people should be thinking about mm -hmm. uh, as they're listening to the program saying, I'm under stress. So what are symptoms, clear symptoms, one, two, three, four, five, whatever they are, uh, put them out on the table. Do, start, doc, Dr. Dalton. Sure. Ahead. So the first thing is that stress is not a disorder. Um, we know that performance actually is at its highest level during moderate periods of stress. So stress mm -hmm. has a lot of very good benefits to it. What we're finding is that people's appraisal of the stress, if they feel like I shouldn't be feeling this, they're going to actually maximize their suffering. So the feelings is okay. The feelings are okay. So much of our suffering comes in that space between what is and what we think should be. Oh, and wow. If we can radically wow. That's very Buddhist, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it is. That's a thing called a third wave in psychology <laughs> uh -huh. that is based on the middle path. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. Uh -huh. Uh, go ahead, jump in. Well, because what, what we're talking about is that stress is a Don't motivator. Don't look at me. Look at them. <laughs> Get me out of here. I, I'm not going to ask any questions for at least, at least a couple of minutes. Okay, so stress is our body's way of telling us something's important, right. and it can motivate us to action. So, for example, if I'm stressed about an upcoming test, uh -huh. ideally that stress is going to make me study, uh -huh. and therefore I'll do better on the test. Uh -huh. I think what the challenge is around uncertainty is that it reminds us of all the things that are out of our control. Yes, sir. So it's not even just focusing on the thoughts, which are important, but it's mm -hmm. also focusing on what's in my control. Mm -hmm. What sorts of behaviors can I engage in, like meditation, mm -hmm. um, like engaging in coping skills, to help me reduce these physical and emotional symptoms I'm having. And so to get back at your other question, oftentimes stress manifests first as physical. People have stomach aches, ah. they have headaches, mm -hmm. they feel really a lot of muscle tension. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also the emotional symptoms, irritability, mm -hmm. fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the sorts of things that people often need to pay attention to first, but they need the language and they need to know what that means in order to even identify it. Are there, let's uh, take uh, uh, a negative ways of coping with stress? Absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I think what most of us do is cope with stress negatively. We avoid it, mm -hmm. we rationalize it, we make excuses for it, we say, well, that's how grandma was, that's how dad is, this is, the, we normalize it. We act as if the agitation, the worrying constantly, the mind racing all the time, the not being able to feel settled, um, the muscle tension, as my colleague has shared, we act as if these things are normal, right? And we act, and normal is a relative term, but we act as if we're always supposed to feel like this. And I think what has to happen for people is for them to understand, and myself included, there's another way to live. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be at that heightened state of functioning all the time because mm. it's counterintuitive. Like we think that that stress is going to push us to do better, like study, but sometimes what it does is it pushes us to paralyzation, mm -hmm. right? Because we can't get out of it. It's hard to come up with the plan because your mind is racing, worrying, uh -huh. and so you're just sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, Amer Americans you know, are known for their inability to take vacations. We're, we're, we're <laughs> like, we lead the world yep. in having trouble 
giving ourselves time yeah. off. Uh -huh. And you know, we overvalue being busy. We yep. think that means we're successful and important. Mm -hmm. And it's not just hard to take vacations like go to another country for two weeks. It's hard for people to take many vacations, whether that's turning their phone off, mm -hmm. getting away from screens, just taking a moment to give themselves permission to just be in the present moment. Because we know we can say stress is a horrible problem affecting all of us, and that's true, but no one can take, you know, all, all that society can do is invite you to be stressed out. Mm -hmm. We each have the power to decline the invitation. Oh, right. mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we do in our offices when people that. come. We say, you know, we know you're being asked to worship the dollar, <laughs> worship promotions. Right. You don't have to fall for that. Mm -hmm. They follow the wrong God home as a song. Yeah, you're worshiping so. a false idol. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right. yeah. And what we're seeing, I, I work with a lot of teens, and what we see that population is getting really affected too. And the data is striking that um, a teen today is five to eight times more likely to show symptoms of an anxiety disorder than their same age peers did during World War II, the Great Depression, mm -hmm. Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing for the first time that teens are more stressed than their parents are. We know that about a third of teens will have at least one anxiety disorder prior to their 18th birthday. Um, we're looking at these incredibly high levels that are ex um, affecting this generation in a way that previous generations never did, even though they objectively appeared to have more things to worry about. Well, well what's going on? Why, why is Screens. that so? Huh? Screens. There's a 24-hour news cycle, and these kids are in, in front of screens. I'm thinking specifically as my colleagues, young people. They're in front of screens 24-7. And so you never turn off the constant barrage um, of stimuli that you can, you know, theoretically you should be able to turn it off and put it to the side. They never turn it off. And so there's all this comparison going on. What are my friends doing that I'm not doing? What parties am I missing that my friends are going to? They're looking at the social media of celebrities. These people look perfect all the time mm -hmm. and they're not, as they're swiping, they're not thinking about how, as I teach young people, all of that stuff is curated. They had a makeup artist, they had a wardrobe, they had a stylist, mm -hmm. they had, before they took that lounging picture, mm -hmm. where they look like they're just sort of, as kids say, chilling out, they weren't. They had a whole bunch of, there's like 10 people working on them to help them look like they're just relaxing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, part of it is, they also, I think the communication between parents and kids is not what it used to be because everybody's on screens. And so there's no, there's nobody sort of teaching our young people how to de-stress, how to get away from the rat race, how to take a step back and take care of themselves in part because we didn't do it as parents, but also in part because we're not communicating in a way that allows parents to see the teens, see that they're stressed and help them find ways to de-stress. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have some data from last year's survey about the relationship between technology and stress. And what we found was individuals who reported using social media had higher stress levels than those who didn't, and those who reported that they were constantly connected to their devices also had significantly higher stress levels. Well, it creates a, a pattern of hypervigilance when you're constantly on. I, I call it facade book because the kids are comparing their highlight, or their, their behind the scenes footage to someone else's highlight That's reel right. and believing that the two somehow are, are congruent and, right. and they're not at all. That's like the celebrity posed in the makeup. Oh, and yeah. the, in, in certain yeah. places, yeah. you can rent a private jet while it's being refueled for Instagram photo shoots. Mm -hmm. so that you can appear to be someone different than you are. That's, mm -hmm. that's a true thing. I had doctor. no idea. Yeah. What are you thinking over there, Doctor? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think a lot of us, you know, there, there's the ever-presence of screens. You know, there's the process of screen time being too high for people. And yeah. if it is too high, if you spend too many hours looking at any screen, you're more likely to have a stress-related disorder or to be depressed. Mm -hmm. But there's also the content, like we're saying, mm -hmm. of what's on mm -hmm. the screen. Mm -hmm. Like, is it, it's perfect looking people, it's rich people, okay. uh, it's beautiful people, it's terrific athletes. And we have this need to measure up. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm gonna say, you know, is it an invitation? You know, our job as therapists and as you know, psychologists is to help people realize that it's okay to be who you are, as imperfect as that is. A lot of this, you know, like I'm, I'm, an, I'm older now, and <laughs> I'm 65, and when I have a 25-year-old person coming in to see me, a lot of what I can offer them is how little I know compared to what I thought I would know when I was like 65. <laughs> I don't know much. <laughs> and sometimes the 25-year-old is sitting over there thinking, I have to know it all, and I have to know it all now. Wow. There's this narrow path to success. That's yep. like a tightrope walk yep. that I have to 
balance myself on because somehow the admission into a certain college or the certain job is a precondition for a happy, meaningful life. That's right. And it's simply inaccurate, but they believe it to be true. Has the whole concept of a, like an American dream changed with, with all of this technology and uh, social media and 24-7 news? And, you know, I kind of get in a position where I'm supposed to know what's going on mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. I can't follow some of the stories. Mm -hmm. You know, they change mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is, you know, I'm not taking a side politically one way or the other, mm -hmm. but the president is a master at changing the story mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if he likes something mm -hmm. or he doesn't like something, he can send out a tweet and mm -hmm. we're off to the races. Mm -hmm. Sometimes very, very hard to just keep up with what's going on. We're an overload. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's it's interesting to think about, you know, how, how are things now in terms of how we consume information compared to 20, 30, or 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, my mom used to tell the story about when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, the whole family was gathered around the radio. Mm -hmm. That isn't how we receive news anymore. We receive news on our on our devices. Right. Mm -hmm. We see ever never-ending uh, pictures on the TV, on the 24 News out cycle. Mm -hmm. We aren't necessarily connected with others when we're receiving bad news. Mm -hmm. It comes in all the time. And so I think there is a sensory overload and we just don't know how to process it and we don't know how to turn it off. Mm. And, I, and I would add to that for our young people, as you said, if everybody's around the radio together, parents can talk with kids and put things in context. There are many times when my teenager will come home and tell me something horrible that's happened in the world that I was, I'm not even aware of yet because she's seen it on the device yes. and it hasn't come on the news yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I'm not there to help sort of monitor and help her process. So it's not necessarily that I need to fix it for her. It is that I would like as a parent to be able to give her context for what she's seeing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that, you know, our young people necessarily have the opportunity to have their parents or the primary caregivers in their lives, provide that for them. So, so uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hearing, and, and it must be very difficult to be a kid today, huh? Mm -hmm. As opposed to what it might have been 20, 30, 40 years ago. Well, they're digital natives. They're born into this world, and it's harder for the generations that precede them to guide them through it because we ah, never experienced yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So they're yeah. kind of the, you know, the canary in the coal mine, so uh -huh. to speak, of, of kind of looking at how this is going to affect them long term. Mm -hmm. um, not only are they um, easily accessible, mm -hmm. accessing these bits of information, mm -hmm. they're also self-selecting which areas they receive the information from. That's right. Well, that's going to be interesting because uh, when they had the hearings like up on the hill with uh, uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, Google and those people, uh, the people on the committee who are all, they don't know anything about technology, yeah, cool. so they weren't asking all the right questions. Exactly Doctor? Right. You got a thought. I like I like the way you process. I like the way you process you things. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the way you think, and then all of a sudden you come up. Well, what I was Go thinking ahead. is that there is, you know, again, you know, stress is not bad, and there's a lot yeah, of things happening in the world that we that are genuinely good, but they also cause stress, like diversity. You know, everyone agrees that if you have a diverse work environment, for example, you get better results. However, if you're talking to someone who does not speak your language, who does not come from your culture, you have to translate. You have to learn how to get along with someone who's different. Uh, it's like you know, people going from their small town high school to a larger university. Okay. It's stressful. It's growth producing, but mm -hmm. it's stressful. Same thing with you know, rapid technological change. Um, it's challenging. It helps us grow. It makes us more effective in a lot of ways, but it means we cannot any longer rest in the comfortable, familiar worlds of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a couple of minutes in this uh, first uh, part of the two-part, and I want to make sure that we, uh, folks who might not see the second show, have some, some kind of coping uh, systems in place uh, uh, that if they're feeling under stress, uh, uh, just toss out a few things that they might be doing differently than maybe what they're doing right now. Dr. Wright, why don't you lead us off? I think one of the things that we really try to focus on is taking active steps to manage your stress. Um, so not being passive, not feeling like you're a victim of the stress, but really doing things that um, will help you feel better in the long term. And so some of the things that we usually focus on is uh, what I call uh, the uh, caregiver 
three, mm -hmm. which is make sure you get enough sleep, mm -hmm. that you're eating healthy, and that you're getting exercise or some activity. Those are some of the foundations. Enough and if you sleep, have that exercise and eating healthy. Because uh -huh. when you have that foundation, then it enables you to problem solve mm -hmm. and to engage in other types of coping skills. Uh, somebody else uh, jump? I'll present a, a counterpoint yeah. to that. Yeah. Just like it's important to be an active problem solving person who copes with stress by doing things like exercise and, and controlling your diet, a lot of what we do now is help people accept what they cannot change. Mm -hmm. And it, I think particularly for Americans, we think we have this control agenda. If we can put a man on the moon, if we can do brain surgery, heart transplants, we can change anything. We can't, and that's okay. For information about This is America and the World, and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is brought to you by Whittle School and Studios. The U.S.-China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States. The Republic of Haiti. The Rotondaro Family Trust. Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow. The Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward thinking public policy and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.